Well, everyone, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome someone who is very inspirational. Uh, her name is Yumiko Kadota. Now, for those of you that don't know who she is, you're about to get to know more about her, but she's released a, a new book, which is called Emotional Female. And I'll read out what it also says on the front, which is a brilliant young surgeon's journey through ambition and, and dedication to exploration and burnout. And what's more is that you wanted to be a surgeon. You're young, gifted and dedicated. You graduated your medical degree with honors and you're well on your way to becoming an outstanding plastic and reconstructive surgeon. You spent 14 years studying. Get that through your brains, everyone. 14 years uh, working 70 hours a week on calls for days at a time, working at numerous hospitals across two states and doing what everyone asked you to do because that's what you needed to become. A doctor is what you thought. Work-life balance was non-existent. And your story is, I believe, really, really incredible. The book is over 400 pages long. Uh, we are going to dive into it today. Yumiko, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast today. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, we were talking just a moment ago about uh, literally my book, <laughs> but today <laughs> is about you and I'm thrilled to actually dive into it. Before we do though, I have one question that I love asking all my guests at the very start, which is what does success look like for you? Oh, that's a great question. For me, success is finding your purpose and being happy with it. Mm. When was the moment for you that you realized that was success? Has it been this gradual thing over time or was there more of a catalyst moment somewhere in your life? It's definitely been a gradual thing. I think that while I was still a young doctor, I always equated success with climbing up that career ladder and getting to the top. But I think what I realized is a lot of people at the top aren't actually that happy. They're not really feeling fulfilled and doing things that they love. And sometimes when you try to do something that you love, there are some barriers that get in the way, which is what I found when I was working in public in the public health system. So I've had to kind of refocus and think about how I need to lead my life in order to, to feel both the sense of purpose, but also loving everything that I do. Mm, I love that. Why do you think people, once they get to the top, they don't feel like they're happy? I think because, oh, we, I think we tie too much of what we do to our identities. And I always say, you know, I do talk to a lot of medical students these days because I do a little bit of teaching at the university. And I say, just remember that medicine is what you do, not who you are. And I think that if you put yeah too much connection to that, you kind of lose yourself a little bit. And so every time things don't work out for you in your job, you take that very personally because you take it on too much as your identity. And I think that's partly the issue when you do make it to the top that everything that goes wrong with work becomes a personal thing and you can't separate that from your sense of your self-value, I guess. Mm. Which I say exactly pretty much the same thing. I, I, I say to people, we need to learn to distinguish between the I am versus I do. And a lot of mm. people, like you write, when, when someone asks you, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? You go, I want to be this. Or when someone asks you, what do you do for a living? I say, I am we put I am in front of it. Yeah, it yeah. Shapes a person's identity by what they do. I think you're spot on with what you do has nothing to do with who you are, who you are. Yeah, definitely. And I think part of the culture when you work at a hospital is you get called by your specialty. So whenever I got phone calls, there was always, oh, hello, is that plastics? And mm -hmm. often people will answer their phone saying, hello, this is plastics. <laughs> and it just sounds so ridiculous, doesn't it, that you just answer you whatever your specialty is, not even with your own name. So you got your degree as a medical doctor. Is yes. that one of the reasons why you don't put doctor in front of your name anymore? Oh, um, sometimes I do, but I guess I'm pretty informal. I'm a pretty casual person. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I am still doing a little bit of work as a doctor, um, but not in the public health system anymore. I'm, I'm working in a few private hospitals. Um, so I am still a doctor, but I don't always feel the need to 
put put it there. <laughs> Cuz my my question to you is of all the professions that you could have chosen growing up, why mm. specifically a doctor because it takes a long time to actually get your degree. Why mm. doctor? First question, and secondly, what kept you going when it was hard? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think that being a doctor kind of married a lot of my different interests. Um, throughout school, I was interested in all sorts of subjects, but I did really like science and I was always fascinated with how the human body worked. But I think that I am naturally a carer as well. I don't know if you know Enneagram, but I'm an Enneagram type two, which is a carer. So I think my natural kind of instinct was to do something where I can connect with people and do something to help. So I think the combination of science and also that human aspect of caring together made medicine a, a really desirable career choice for me. Mm. Um, and I definitely don't regret going through that path because I did have some really good experiences. It was very rewarding. It still is very rewarding. Um, and the thing that kept me going was was really the interactions I had with patients. Um, whenever I, I was able to do something to help someone, um, it made me feel good. It made me feel like I was doing something to help the community and to help another human. And I guess the human aspect is important. We're not robots. I think that anyone who's ever been in the hospital, it's not a, it's not a fun time. No one chooses to be there. You're either sick or you have an injury and any any kind of interaction that makes you feel good, I think makes a difference to your experience as a patient. And I felt like that was something I could offer. Like, even if it's just one kind word, um, that aspect, that aspect of caring kind of kept me going. Mm. We have a running joke in, in our family about me because they're like, Oh, yeah. what's another hospital trip for Jay? Because oh, no. I, I spent most of my life in and out of hospital. So I know oh. exactly what you're talking about by, like it's not a fun place to be in, but mm. I think for me, I tried to make the most of it. Like I had that caring attitude towards the young people. Like whenever yeah. I was in any of the renal wards or uh, you name it, I would just be like seeing their faces, trying to make them smile. It didn't matter if I was in pain. Um, oh, that's so sweet. And some of the, the best memories that I do have are from literally doctors that would come and, and, treat me and their mm -hmm. attitude towards me and some of the worst memories in fact come from doctors too <laughs> oh <laughs> definitely that's why it's so important isn't it what what a doctor or a nurse or any health professional say says makes such a difference to someone's experience you only need to say one wrong thing to make someone feel like they're not cared for or or for someone to lose their trust in your yeah in your competence or your care um, so it's so it's extremely important how you interact with people. So how did you go about building trust with your patients in hospital? Yeah, I think that building rapport is really important, even if it's something conversational, whether it's something they might have watched on the telly or something they're reading or wearing, you know, just a little point of conversation just to just to break the ice a bit and just spending that time to get to know them as a person mm. and not just treat their disease, I think is really important. Mm. So is there any standout story for you of any patient that sort of you treated over your time that challenged you at all that gave you this like down moment yeah I, I write about it in my book in emotional female there's one interaction where a patient didn't want me because I was Asian um, she saw me and said oh I'll have an Aussie thanks um, and that did challenge me because obviously as an Asian person it's a extremely offensive to hear that but when you're at work you have to be professional so you can't talk back or say anything um so it really took a lot for me to just step back and not feel angry um i excused myself i actually had to go to like a store cupboard to hide for a bit and catch my breath because I'd never been told that ever in my line of work. I'd been a doctor at that stage for about three years. And it was the first time anyone had ever kind of questioned my competence based on my, my color. 
Um, and as it turned out, that patient had had a um, bad experience with the Chinese doctor beforehand. And so she had this impression that all these kind of overseas doctors were incompetent. Um, but gee, that was hard. That was really hard. I think that was definitely the most challenging time for me. So can you share what was actually going through your mind the moment mm. that person said what they said to you? I think I was just shocked. Mm. I was just shocked that anyone would say that because when you think of yourself as a professional, it shouldn't really matter what you look like as long as you're competent and you know what you're doing. Um, that that should be enough. I, I never felt like I needed to prove my competence, especially based on how I looked, but that was really the start of it, I think. Mm. So moving towards your book and so it's called Emotional Female for those people that want to watch the video right now. I'm holding it up. It's 400 pages, which is a huge story to, to honestly share and put what's what you've been through in a in a mm -hmm. book is honestly it takes courage. And I'm curious for you, if I was to open this book and mm -hmm. turn it to any page or chapter that is yeah. to either give me a challenge or it's going to give me a renewed perspective on my life, which one would you recommend I turn to? There is a chapter called Aparigraha towards the end. And that was about my recovery. After I burnt out, I became really mentally unwell. I got diagnosed with depression. Mm -hmm. And part of my recovery was about finding that identity again that we spoke about before. And um, I, I know that yoga is not for everyone, but for me, that was an important part of yeah, of my recovery and not just like the poses, you know, you see all the Instagram yogis with their fancy human pretzels and handstands and stuff, but it's, uh, it was an experience for me that was a lot deeper than that because I went into the yoga philosophy, which is an important part of yoga practice. And so reading those philosophy texts was actually what helped me the most because it helped me kind of, yeah, feel okay with myself again and uh, kind of forgive myself for what had happened mm. and, and feel more positive moving forward that it, everything was going to be okay. So that word, aparigraha, is a Sanskrit word that means disidentification. Mm. And and reading the passages related to that was, was, I think, what helped me the most. So how long were you a doctor for before you decided to just quit? Oh, um, nearly eight years. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the 14 years was six years of study and eight years of work. And at the time I was 30 years old. So 14 years was nearly half my life. So for me to move away from it after dedicating so much time and effort to it was really hard. I did agonize over that decision, but I don't regret it at all. I needed to do it for my health. Um, cause my mental health was suffering so badly in that last term. And I was even getting, physically unwell as well so it, i just i just couldn't keep going mm. so talk to me about that so what was happening that made you uh your mental health and your physical health were you just working too much you didn't know how to help yeah. handle it? that that was a lot of it um I was working in quite an understaffed hospital and so i was taking a lot of the burden and because I had done um, operations in the past, I, I was kind of left to my own devices in a way. I was doing operations still late at night. I was really sleep deprived. Lots of 24 hour on call shifts, which means that um, anyone can call you at any time in the middle of the night. So you can't, you can't relax. You're, you're in a state of mental unrest because you know that you might get called in at any time. Um, so those 24 hour shifts were a killer, even if I wasn't physically at the hospital. And so that I think was bad for my mental health. And it was just a really, um, unfriendly environment as well, because things were so poorly run. Everyone was stressed, even patients and their relatives were really aggressive towards me when surgeries would get canceled. I felt like I it was, I was really out of control because a lot of things I couldn't manage. It was kind of yeah, out of my control, how the operating theaters ran, I could only kind of do what I, 
you know, that I, I could as one person and, um, yeah. And all of that, um, led to me being really unwell. And I guess there are also subtle layers on top of that. Um, there's a lot of discussion these days about microaggressions in the workplace, mm. um, whether it's race or gender. Um, those little things do kind of add up and they're invisible things. So it's kind of hard to, to measure or notice. But I think that all the little comments and behaviours in the workplace kind of added up and led to the, I guess, the emotional side of the burnout. Um when we talk about burnout, it's a lot easier to talk about physical burnout because you can look at the hours and the feeling of tiredness is easy to explain, but the emotional tiredness is, is definitely harder to talk about. But for me, that a huge element of what happened to me was that emotional side of the burnout. Mm. And you also encountered sexual harassment, I believe, in the workplace. Uh, I did, yeah. How did that make you feel? Gosh, it was so hard because I was still really, I was only 19 and this was a professor, you know, a professor who really kind of abused his, his power by, by doing that. I was very vulnerable at the time because I was doing a cancer term and seeing the chemotherapy section was really triggering for me because my godmother had died from, from cancer of the cervix. And so seeing that was really hard for me. And so this professor came across as someone who was willing to help me and support me through my term. And he was um, trained in counseling. So during one of the counseling sessions is when he kind of touched me inappropriately. And I felt trapped and I felt like I couldn't say anything to anyone because, you know, he's someone who lectures us. He's someone who examines us. You know, I didn't want him to fail me. Um, so it's really hard for medical students and junior doctors to speak up when something like that happens. Um, but it's, uh, I was really shocked, but 10 years after that happened, I read a news, the newspaper article that he had actually gone to jail. So he'd obviously done it to somebody else. Um, and that was really hard for me too, because I felt a lot of guilt for not saying anything. Because maybe if I had said something, it, it would have stopped him from doing it to another woman. Um, but at the same time, I felt like it maybe no one would have believed me as a medical student. He was a very, you know, well respected professor. So um, yeah, there are so many challenges challenges like that in medicine, even now. Mm. Do you regret not? speaking up at the time? Yeah, I do. I mean, I spoke to um, someone at the university about it and she did ask me whether I wanted to make a formal complaint, um, but I, I, I felt like I couldn't. Mm. Um, and, and maybe if I had, um, yeah, he would have stopped earlier. It, it's hard to say really. Yeah. Mm. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of perpetrators get away with it for a really long time. I mean, look at what's happening with Christian Porter as well, with, you know, with the government not even doing an, an inquiry into it. So uh, people in these positions of power do tend to get away with a lot of these kind of behaviours. I know what you mean. Now, I'm not a female, I'm a, a male, I'm white, you know, considered privileged in, in the society and I can literally admit that but for me you know i was sexually abused when i was six mm. and to have have that feeling of you can't say anything to anyone it's it's entrapment yeah oh i'm so sorry that that happened to you at six no, years it, old it, it's goodness. okay it, it's honestly okay and i don't like i don't have any regrets at all because I did tell my mum and mm -hmm. they did do something about it. You know, yeah. You, you, I think you, everyone that has been through some sort of sexual trauma, they kind of think of the what if scenario straight away. Oh yeah. And, and you know what? I, I had my book launch the other week with, um, with a lovely Bree Lee and she said to me, let me remind you that we are not responsible for other people's behaviors. Mm. And that was, I think, an important thing that she said there. Mm, I, I can and agree. I, 
Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I'm glad that you've been able to show resilience and be successful now because a, a lot of other people are so traumatized. And I think we can't kind of ignore the fact that that survivors of sexual or any sort of abuse, they do suffer from really poor mental health and, and, you know, some people even end their lives because of it. So it is such a serious issue. And I hope it's something that governments and health institutions, all institutions pay attention to because it is um, affecting not just women, as you say, um, you know, there are male survivors as well um, because it does affect people's mental health and it does ruin people's lives. Mm. There's, I've done a lot of, and I've had a lot of conversations with people about Mm. trauma and how that impacts the brain. It's not just sexual trauma. That's just part part of the equation. It's mental, it's emotional, and you're going to have, like feelings of of guilt that's trauma that you're putting on yourself and yeah you constantly are beating yourself up about once again the what if scenarios what if i did this and you're putting so much pressure and anxiety and stress on a precious mind mm. there's, there's no reason to and yeah i'm i'm curious for you yumiko you mentioned like mm. you needed to forgive yourself Forgive yourself of what? I felt like for the longest time that I had failed because for me, becoming a surgeon was my dream, my goal. That's what I put everything into. And I also felt like I was disappointing my parents as well. I mean, they supported me financially through the degree as well. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't have had the privilege of an education like that. Um, And so I felt like I was letting my parents down. And in fact, I couldn't even tell them when I first quit. Um, And, you know, they had recently moved back to Japan. So it was kind of easy for me to hide it from them. I had this secret life for about six months, Um, but my mental health continued to deteriorate and I ended up in hospital. Um, So I quit in in June and I ended up in hospital around October. Mm -hmm. And it was only then that I was able to tell my mom because I thought, okay, maybe now she'll forgive me because I can tell her I worked so hard that I actually got sick. Mm -hmm. And that was my excuse. Um, But yeah, that, that's the feeling, you know, I think it's um, such a common thing to feel guilt when things don't work out, even though I, I know now looking back that, that I, I made the right choice and I needed to do it for myself and to protect my health. Um, but for the longest time, I, I questioned whether I made the right decision and whether I needed to keep going. And I think that, you know, health care systems do tend to gaslight their employees, making you feel like the crazy one. For, for the longest time, I felt like the problem was with me. But I guess the beauty of having shared this story now publicly is that so many other people, not just women, men as well, have come forward and said, yeah, the system broke me. Mm -hmm. And that's been really validating for me to know that it wasn't just me and that the hours I were working were unacceptable. And it's really the systems that the hospital system that needs to take responsibility for what they're doing to the workers because they're the hospitals are driving out a lot of healthcare professionals because of these kind of unsafe and, and hostile working conditions. Mm. And I mean, like you just look at COVID as a prime example, like the mm. amount of people that would probably be working overtime. Oh yeah. The hospital system. Like I feel for them. It's. Yeah. And a lot of it's unpaid over time as well. I'm not sure if you saw in the news, but in, in Victoria, they've kind of launched a class action for mm. junior doctors and all the, the overtime that they do that's unpaid. You know, there's kind of this greedy doctor narrative out there that doctors are wealthy and all that. And some, some doctors at the top are, yep. um, but junior doctors work a lot of hours and compared to the kind of corporate counterparts with the equivalent education and training doctors, junior doctors don't earn as much. And so, you know, (laughs) sometimes I get asked, well, you know, doctors get paid lots of money kind of thing, Mm. who cares kind of thing. But um, it it is a job where it is important to protect those um, working in it because it is um, an important role. You know, if doctors are overworked and, sleep deprived and not treated well, they're not going to thrive. And 
like literally patients' lives are in doctors' hands. So it is important to to make sure that doctors are being well looked after. Mm. I think patients often forget that doctors are still human. They still have Oh yeah. We we're, we're definitely not robots. <laughs> no. We we get tired, we make human errors and you know, I always draw the parallels with driving. You, you know, fatigue is one of the biggest killers on the roads. Um and you don't want the risk of human error, especially if someone's going to perform an operation on you and and you don't want to cause complications because the doctor is um you know, not in, not in a good state. Mm. You could um cost someone their life if you're not careful. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think your message is is so valuable. And I think this conversation needs to be had more that mm. society needs to listen because the system is broken. It's been broken for goodness knows how long. And yeah. but because it's a system that has been around for donkey's years, that's the problem. Like everyone says, Oh, I trust the system, it works. Let's go through the system. Like same thing with the ed- educational system. Like mm. you spend years of your life studying to do something that you've always dreamed of doing. And then when you get there in that exact moment, you feel what's happened. This is not exactly what I've dreamed it to be. It's, completely- yeah. it's there, there's, yeah. there's a brilliant book called teacher by Gabby Stroud. I'm not sure if you've read it, but she, um, you know, she was so passionate about teaching. She obviously is really great with kids, but then when she became a teacher, it was not what she was expecting. There's all these kind of bureaucratic red tape and politics and all these kind of standards that kids have to go through. And it takes away the joy of teaching mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and it takes away kind of the agency from teachers, you know, teachers aren't able to, to really do what they they do best connect with kids and teach and and have a bit more creative flair with what they're doing to support each individual student because they have to follow these strict criteria and um these exams and things so re- reading that book actually was really interesting because i guess all of these things have so many um parallels in different industries it's not just medicine um anyone who enters a profession enters it because they're interested in the actual work mm. but the, the systemic factors kind of take away from your primary role, I guess, all this other stuff you have to do and put up with. hundred mm, percent. Like we're seeing increased amounts of kids as young as six or five with severe anxiety, panic mm. attacks, high levels of stress. And that's not right. Like, yeah got to look at it from the point of view of why why now of all the times Mm. because when I was growing up I didn't have well I had my pressures but later on but yeah as a as a kid no way I enjoyed life you know yeah you need to play and explore not be stressed out about exams when you're so little (laughs) Mm. I was listening to a, a an episode with doc, Dr. Jordan Peterson this morning about, oh, yes. about this very thing. It's after the age of four, if you don't learn how to play before the age of four, you don't ever learn it. Mm. It's almost like for a lot of kids, they don't learn how to play before the age of four and so they're missing out and so therefore they've got all this pressure and all this weight on, on themselves and then parents like guilty as charged. I wanted to play yeah. with parents. I wanted to give them the best. And I, I think you felt the exact same. And yeah. when you had that conversation with your mum, mm. what was her response? Oh, she was just gorgeous. I was so surprised. I, I felt silly. I thought, oh, of course she's supportive. She's my mother. But I was too scared to talk to her about it, especially because you know, no one in my family has any mental health issues and I'd never had any mental health issues until that point. So it was something I was too scared to talk about. I I thought that maybe, you know, in Japan, there might be some taboo. And she was like, honey, it's 2018. What are you talking about? So she was so great. And she, yeah. And I went, I did go back to Japan that Christmas and and she really looked after me and made me feel like, like everything was going to be okay because she was, you know, I think most parents, they just want their kids to be happy. And I think she was pretty devastated to see me like that. Um, yeah, but she, 
I was, oh, I was so relieved and I thought, oh, I'm so silly. Why didn't I tell her before? I probably could have used some motherly support, but yeah, both my parents were, were really great about it. They've been very accepting of it. And, um, I think, yeah, I, I had nothing to worry about. <laughs> mm. So if there's any, any kids out there, I, I know a lot of Asian people have, um, spoken to me since I, I wrote a blog post about this two years ago, they, they felt scared to talk to their parents, but I just want people to, to have the courage to talk to your parents because parents, you know, they do care about you. Don't be scared. Mm. Well, that's a powerful message to send to young kids mm -hmm. right now, or even adults that might be struggling with this. Um, yeah. It's so hard to talk about, isn't it? This kind of, and I think especially for men as well, I've, I've spoken to quite a few men about this and I guess we have this culture of kind of toxic masculinity. I know that word's probably overused, but there's this kind of idea that men should not express their emotions and not show their vulnerability. Um, and, and that can lead to a lot of mental health problems too. I mean, suicide among young men is kind of a big issue in Australia. So um, for any guys out there too, don't be afraid to talk about it. Like you'd be surprised by how many people actually are affected um, by mental health issues and illnesses. I mean, when I first started talking to friends about it, there's so many friends who were like, oh yeah, I take an antidepressant for anxiety or, or I take this or that. Uh, I see a counselor or a therapist, like, it's incredibly common. And the more you talk about it, the the less stigmatized it becomes. And, you know, going to therapy should be something that even, you know, quote unquote, normal people do. You don't have to be sick to go and see a therapist. It's a way of enhancing your self-awareness and, and how you interact with others. It's, it's I, I found it very beneficial and I'm very open about talking about it because it, it does help. Mm. And that's what I've found with this as well. Like, having these conversations, these deep and meaningful ones, it's a healing yeah. process, not just for yeah. those people that are listening, but I get to heal as well. Cause then I realize, Hey, I'm not the only one that has been through depression, anxiety, mm. suffered panic attacks, you know, felt worthless, all this stuff or suffered trauma, traumas, like ultimately it's, it's all okay. In, yeah. in the and I want to say for those people that are listening right now, and I've said it often, doesn't matter where you are in life, you are exactly where you need to be. It might not exactly be where you want to be, but it's mm. every, everything that you need it to be for you to excel in your life, for you to realize right now where you are is, is your choice. You, you can be better. You can improve. You, you don't have to remain stuck in depression or anxiety or not knowing your worth. Like go and ask someone that you trust, go and ask a question to someone, just do it because you can potentially save your own life and you can save someone else's life. You just don't know. Yeah. And we're all just trying our best and not every day is going to be a day forward. Um, I always say recovery is not linear. There'll be some days where you feel like you're going backwards or you're feeling worse than the day before. And that's, that's completely normal. Not every day is going to be a good day. And, um, and it's, it's about learning how to deal with those bad days, I guess, and preparing for them and knowing that it'll pass and there will be better days. Mm. Um, that, that for me has been a, in a lesson as well, because I'm one of those people who, always want to move forward so it is it is it was hard for me when I was having some of those kind of backward days but mm. you know it's all it's it's all a part of the recovery and it's okay if if you feel like you're going backward sometimes mm. perfect message I was actually speaking over like a live zoom this morning to close yeah. to 100 people about overcoming rejection and mm. it was a, it was a great conversation, not because I spoke, but because they <laughs> had so many questions, and yeah. it just made me realize that there are a lot of people out there that do have questions, they do have bad days, they have those down moments, and I love that message of everyone goes through it. You're not alone. Yeah. So each and every day is different, and that's what make that's what makes life exciting. Ultimately, 
that no two. And everyone days. else is failing too. They just don't want you to know about it because no one posts about their failures. We only see everyone's highlight reels, right? So we've all had rejections and failures. So you're definitely not alone if you feel like you, you're having all these setbacks. And I one of my favorite memes that I screenshot on my phone is something like, let your comeback be greater than your setback. Mm. So always plan for that, you know, moment to to shine because you will. So don't worry about the setbacks. Wow. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's a good meme, isn't it? I look at that every time I'm feeling a bit crappy about myself. I look at that and I go, yeah, it'll be okay. <laughs> I look at, um, I have this and oh. this is, so I told you the title of my book before. Yes the path of an eagle and the reason behind it is my live verse is from Isaiah 40 verse 31 for those people that are non-spiritual or what have you the verse basically talks about if you ever get tired if you ever get weary you can hope and rest on the Lord because Mm -hmm. he will renew your strength he will enable you to get up on the wings of eagles because an eagle wasn't made for the ground he wasn't made to stay there It was made for the skies to soar above the heavens. And no matter what, I say this as well in my book, that the eagle loves the challenge. The eagle loves Mm. the storm because the moment it sees a storm, it climbs through the the clouds and uh, the heavy rain and the wind and all that sort of stuff. And once it gets to the top, it knows that it's become better. So Mm. those, those setbacks that you might be experiencing right now are exactly the kind of things that you need for setups later on. Love yeah. it. <laughs> That's such a powerful symbol with the eagle. Mm. It's um, it's my spirit animal. <laughs> I, I say it's the path of an eagle because my life, as I can imagine with your own life, Yumiko, has just been like this incredible roller coaster ride, mm. up and down, up and down, but then – when I look back and when I reflect on all the things that I have been through and I put all that stuff on, in, in, into, a, into a book, into pages, I realized one important thing, that my path isn't like anyone else's. Yeah. It's different. And that's the best part. It's, yeah, you have to choose your own path and you, you can't really emulate others because we all have different values and priorities. So I always say that every decision you make should be based on your values. Mm, 100%. A couple more questions for you, Yumiko, because I do want to be yeah. mindful of your time. So sure. if people want to get a copy of your book, how can they, how can they get a copy first and foremost? And secondly, why did you decide to write a book? Well, um, it's out at, well, they say all good bookstores, but I'm sure bad bookstores as well. I don't know why they always say that line. <laughs> is there such a thing as a bad bookstore though? I know. I don't <laughs> think so. Um, yeah, it's um, it's published by Penguin Books. So it's been distributed um, to all the indie bookshops, all the big bookshops too online. You can get it from Amazon and Booktopia. So a few different options there. It's even at, um, you know, Target, Big W, wherever you like to get your books from. Mm. And why did I write a book? Um, I, you know, it's so important to get this story out there because there are so many um, issues with the healthcare system at the moment. And it's, yeah, doctors are not just burnt out and suffering poor mental health. There are even doctors who take their lives each year. It is a real tragedy. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately it's something that everyone should care about because they're the people looking after your health when you get sick. So I think we need a strong and healthy workforce looking after everybody. And it's also a way of sharing, um, you know, uh, a woman's experience as well. There's so much sexism and misogyny in all industries at the moment and talking about it i think does raise awareness of what's acceptable and what's not Mm. um and and it was just a way for me to document what happened to me as well i guess it's been an important part of recovery i mean sometimes it was pretty traumatizing to write it 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 was not easy there were times where i just needed to take a break from it because it was a bit too much um but i think that in order to grow um you do need to confront these kind of dark times as awful and uncomfortable as it might make you feel 
there's, I, I recently came across this concept of the post-traumatic growth. Mm. You have to kind of accept some of the things that have happened in order to, to move forward and, and, and create a life with greater purpose and, and finding that meaning again. And so I think for me to reflect on what, what happened was a really important part on my own kind of personal growth as a human. So, um, I wrote, so that's why I wrote it. (laughs) I love it. Um, as we come to a close, my, my final question for you, this is my all time favorite question that I ask everyone at the end. Now it's a hypothetical one. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it (laughs) magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Oh, wow. I mean, being Japanese, I probably will reach 100. (laughs) But um, love it. you know what? I hope that emotional female is not in there because (laughs) there's so much more to life you know those are some of the difficult things to talk about but I hope that there'll be something joyous in there my kind of silly medical puns and bad jokes and and yeah hopefully more joyous things yeah what's next for you Yumiko Oh, well, I hope that if this book does well, I'll be able to write another one. Um, I did enjoy the writing process. Um, But really, for me, it's about learning how to chill out because I'm such a workaholic. So I'm still trying to find that balance. Um, So I'm, yeah, what's next for me is is creating that well-balanced, happy life. Mm. Well, I have no doubt that your book will do well because it's a needful message. Uh, go and pick up a copy at any good bookstore, online, anywhere you want. But Yumiko, thank you so much for your time today, for your story, everything that you've been through. I acknowledge it. I honor it. And just want to say thank you for coming on the Storybox podcast today. Thank you, Jay. It was so lovely to talk to you.